I was in the um, United States Army for two years, drafted. And then I got out of the military, went to college, and graduated in 1963 in a BS degree. Since then, I have been in a graduate program for nuclear engineering. Also, I've taken pre-med, and I've been working contracts uh, since 1963 also for NASA, Department of Energy, and several other electronic firms in the Washington, D.C. area. In 1957 to 59, I was um, mostly in <clears throat> outside of Albany, Maryland, just north of Washington, D.C., at a Nike Ajax missile facility. I was a radar operator. Um, <clears throat> in May of 1958, about 6 a.m., and the reason I knew it was 6 is because that's when everybody got up. I looked out the window. At first, I heard a sound. It sounded like a pulsating transformer. I looked out the window and looked across the field and saw this object heading towards the ground and saw it crash, it broke apart, and then it took off again in flight. I <clears throat> immediately got dressed, went up onto the hill where the, uh, where the radar was, um, got in a, a telescope that we tracked the North Star with to line our an radar antennas and sat and mounted on that radar uh, and looked at the pieces that were laying across the field. And the largest piece that I saw, which was actually glowing white hot, was a, probably the size of a washing machine. <clears throat> Shortly thereafter, the Air Force personnel had arrived um, going across this field and started picking up these pieces. Now, they used long poles very long poles uh, to pick up the biggest piece and they proceeded to put it on a truck that was lead line truck and pushed it in with another long pole and got it inside the truck itself. Then the other personnel uh, picked up the other pieces that were laying about. Now what's interesting about it is the from my knowledge of nuclear things now, I recall that these personnel were wearing um, <clears throat> radiation suits, protective suits. Uh, and then they proceeded to take the material away, I have no idea where it went. The other issue there was that when the craft took off again after it crashed, it went through a grove of trees, which it actually sheared three, four, five inch limbs in just one fell swooper like a knife or a machete. Well, that wasn't the real exciting part. The real exciting part happened the next evening while I was on duty, and it was approximately 10, 11 at night, and I got a call from the Gaithersburg uh, facility saying that they had 10, or, I'm sorry, 12 to 15 UFOs 50 to 100 feet off the ground. So I asked the guy who was on the radio with me, I said, what do they sound like? He took his head mic off, put it out the van window, and it, again, the pulsating sound, except there were more of them. <clears throat> and he was describing them and uh, in different shapes and, and so forth. I had the radar on, the M33 radar, sweep radar, and I found the Right next to the ground clutter of where Gaithersburg sits, we found the I uh, found the blip where these uh, <clears throat> vehicles were, and then all of a sudden they all took off at the same time. And from my radar scope, it went one sweep. It's a 33 and a third RPM to go that distance from the center out to where I got the next blip in the first sweep at a constant velocity would have to be 17,000 miles an hour, which we calculated from our um, analog computer. Uh, it was probably ex in excess of 30 feet in diameter. It, um, it had circular balls appeared on the outer rim up close to a, um, a cake-like fixture on top. And, that's, and they were different colors. They were orange and red and, and some yellow, but they were pulsating. So, I mean, it it was quite a sight to see as it was um, 
wobbling towards the earth and hit. And it came in at a fairly rapid rate. How far away was it from you? Uh, where it cracked, well, it came down, it came actually over top of the barracks. So I actually saw the tail end of where it crashed it was approximately 2,000 yards. And the reason I know that is because it paralleled the launch pad, which is 2,000 yards away. There was one uh, individual on guard duty who actually saw it come in and went over top of him. And the guard shack was just a few yards away from the barracks. And he saw that actually come down and crash all the way from from when he first uh, when it first appeared. But you said the retrieval was apparently by Air Force. The Air Force, yes, it was outside the uh, fences of the target tra or the tra radar area and also the launch pad. So it was in the civilian area. It landed in this person's uh, cornfield. In fact, the farmer was actually standing there washing his hands when he saw it crash and take off again. It's near Mount Zion, Maryland. It's just on the other side of Mount Zion, going east. I do know that the article hit the New York Times the next day. What um, year was this? 58. May of 58. May of 58. A directive came down not to mention this to anybody anyway. But it, of course, by this time, it was already out in the newspapers. What did occur was when I tracked the next night, I tracked those um, vehicles that were taking off. Um, there was a question as to what they really were, and the, and the general came back and said, well, those were uh, helicopters, and they were in doing some Navy, Army, Air Force maneuvers. So that was... And we all had a big laugh about that one. <laughs> that was the cover story used, yes. And obviously there were other area, other people had radars on it. I actually saw those go off also. I had another one which I can't say too much about. I can't say where I was. I was at a, a facility in California, that's all I can say, and I was doing particular classified work uh, set aside from what was actually happening there. It was a completely different scenario. <clears throat> The only thing I can say is it was it was occurring at the same time that our astronauts were doing a loop around the moon and back again. <clears throat> On their trip to the to that moon or to the moon itself, I heard the expression of the bogey coming in at eleven o'clock. Well, familiar with that particular term, I perked my ears and started listening a little bit, and discovered that um, Houston and the astronauts were talking back and forth about a collision. And the astronauts asked for uh, permission to do avoidance for a collision, and Houston finally granted that permission to do that. And after the, after the comm length settled down a little bit, the astronauts said, it's not necessary. They are now par paralleling our course, and there was a discussion as to what was paralleling that course. There was another type of ship. There were portals there that they could see in. They could see beings of some sort. They did not describe these beings. They just took photographs. And after a while, a few thousand miles, and then they took off from the capsule that they were flying in and went away. They just said it was saucer-like. A saucer-like craft. Craft, yes. That was paralleling their craft. Actually paralleling their craft. And it was just far enough away they couldn't really distinguish. They saw movement. They saw something, something somebody moving inside there and inside that ship. This is before the landing, yes. It was probably in 68, 67 maybe, somewhere in that time frame. All they said was, they, there they go. And they went out of sight almost immediately from there from their conversation. It was unedited because of the, where I was. An extremely restricted channel. As a matter of fact, when I was doing work at NASA, I got into the NASA library looking for the tapes. Never did find them. There's only one gentleman there that um, said I shouldn't. No, he said like, <laughs> you didn't hear anything. And I said, hear what? That was into that. 
In fact, the gentleman was very disturbed I was even there for what I was doing. A bogey is when you're, when you're flying is, is an object coming in and normally during World War II they used those and also Korean War as a term for potential enemy craft approaching. And if they don't know the aircraft type, they call it a bogey. Approximately halfway to the moon. On the way to? On the way to the moon. Okay, yes. there. Their reactions were somewhat stoic. I mean, no big thing. They didn't go, wow, look at that. Look what I'm seeing now. Nothing like that at all. They just said, the bogey's next to us and they're flying. Very professional. Not surprising. I don't know what instrumentation they particularly had, but they knew that their course were, they were going to intersect. No question about it. So they must have had some device that would tell them that. It's obvious in space, I wouldn't imagine. Very good Turkish friends. I went scuba diving with them, some other things. And, uh, uh, he would talk about the eastern part of Turkey as being a great UFO place. I just asked him for I said, what do you mean, a great UFO place? He said, oh, we have sightings out there all the time. Never reported. So I inquired uh, with a couple of my Turkish...